pursuing your dreams is so scary, but what if you did? What if you, you know, what can you learn from this movie about about what the, what the payoff can be and what it can be like on the other side of that when you when you when you go through that that kind of scary wall of fire and and want something more for yourself. Hello and welcome back to You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Dr. Julie Johnson. I am the president founder here at Heart and Solutions, uh, mental health counseling and behavioral health counseling. So if you are looking for mental health counseling or behavioral health counseling in one of our six office locations in Iowa, or if you're looking for telehealth sessions, if you're in Iowa, we can do those phone services still. We can do those computer sessions still. Um, If you've got children that you're looking for behavior behavioral health, uh, especially with summer coming up. I know it seems like a long way away, but in two months, those kids are going to be out of school and they're going to be our problem. (laughs) When we, when my kids come home, it's like, oh man, okay. Now they're home for the summer. Right. So it's not too early to be thinking about that and to be getting those in-home behavioral health services set up for your kiddos through the week, because the structure of school is so helpful for so many of those different symptoms. And then in the summer, a lot of those structures go away. So so now is a great time to be setting up those in-home behavioral health sessions weekly uh, so that in the summer, at least that structure just continues to keep going uh, for the kiddos. And I'm Krista Hunt. I am the vice president at Heart and Solutions in charge of that BHIS department. So BHIS stands for Behavioral Health Intervention Services. And that is our program where we go in home and work with children ages four through 18 on different behavioral skills. And we can also see them right now over telehealth or in our offices as well. So this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are designed for people curious about counseling, but have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. Yeah, so we post a new episode every Sunday night at 5 p.m. Central Time. Uh, so we encourage you to batch up your clean laundry to put away into outfits or batch up all your meal prep and do that on Sunday nights while you listen to the episode. That gives you an entire week of clean clothes and outfits or an entire week of lunches already prepared for yourself. Uh, And Krista and I will be putting away our clean laundry at that same time. That also gives you that entire week to get in touch with either your counselor, if you haven't seen your counselor in a while, uh, or to get in touch with uh, the services or get connected with the resources that we have talked about that week. Um, So this week, we've got a fellow podcaster, uh, a fellow clinician um, in a neighboring state. Uh, So we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Terry Bly uh, to the show today. Welcome, Terry. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. So uh, Dr. Terry Bly is a licensed clinical psychologist at Ellie Mental Health Services in Minnesota. She is able to do telehealth services as well in Minnesota, phone, computer, uh, but she's also able to do in-person services if you're in the Twin Cities. So uh, Ellie Mental Health in Minnesota, but also nationwide, uh, you can find Ellie Health providers. Um, So welcome to the show. I'm very excited to talk about your podcast. So uh, Terry hosts the podcast When Therapists Watch TV. Oh my goodness, has TV become such a a bigger part of our lives over the last few years? Um, We've got more content than ever. We can watch it whenever we want. Mm -hmm. Um, And we there were a couple of years there where we didn't have a lot else going on and we were yeah. watching a lot of TV. Yeah. Um, so tell me where this idea came from, this podcast, when therapists watch yeah. TV. Well, so I I'm I'm gonna guess I, I love television. And I'm guessing that's because I have a background in theater. Um yeah. and I did like commercials and TV for a while too. So I've I've always loved theater and um and that just kind of lends itself to television. And I remember when I was a theater major, um, or one of my directors would always talk about how theater is a mirror. And it was created by the, you know, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks to, sh- to serve as a mirror for society, to like show us 
who we are, our best parts of ourselves, our worst parts of ourselves. And TV is clearly to me, um, you know, like the next generation of that. I mean, theater still does that, but I think television does that in a way that theater and movies can't really do because we get to see how characters develop over time, how relationships develop over time. And so I got this idea for the podcast after I found myself recommending um, Ted Lasso to a lot of my clients. I started watching that show during the pandemic and I don't know, it just struck some chords with me and I wanted my clients to watch it because there were so many things that I thought they could learn about, you know, stuff we were talking about in therapy or, um, you know, couples stuff that I, I just thought, wow, this here's a really good example of repair in a relationship. And so I just found myself doing, I found myself recommending the, the um, movie soul, which was only on uh, TV because that was during the pandemic as well. And that's another beautiful movie. Um, anyway. And so I started thinking about, like, what, wouldn't it be cool to do a podcast where like some therapists and I just talk about how can you use TV? Cause I'd mentioned this to other people and they'd be like, I don't know, really TV is like, like a way to learn about yourself. And I was like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> There's so many things we can learn and so many things I'm seeing. And so, yeah. So when we started doing podcasts here at Ellie, I pitched this idea because I thought this is a great way for us as therapists to give our clients approachable really approachable ways to to view some of the concepts we talk about with them in therapy um so yeah so we've got uh three episodes out now we've got a fourth coming um, we're doing five about ted lasso and then we're going to really start opening it up to all sorts of tv shows um shrinking is just an obvious one because it's about therapists and then we're going to do last of us um which is a, a a very popular show now that's actually based on a video game but it's about relationships and trauma and so yeah so that's how I got the idea it kind of combined all of the things that I've loved um throughout my life and and gave me a, a forum to do that in a way that I hope helps people awesome so is your podcast more focused on like therapists that you see in tv or like you were saying like no. the, the characters of the show then I'm actually trying to to veer away from just focusing on therapists and tv in part because I feel like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the most part, I feel like what we can say about therapists on TV is like, that's not really what we do. <laughs> that's not it. Um, and I didn't want to just do, a, and, no, granted, Dr. Sharon on Ted Lasso is a great therapist, but we're not really focusing on her because um, I think what's more interesting is to is to watch the characters, to focus on the characters. Um, you know, we did a, an episode about trauma and how trauma shows up in our lives, as we develop our personalities, as we figure out who we are and how we show up in the world, to me, that's a way more interesting way to use television. Um, and I don't want to just focus on shows that have therapists. I mean, these first two that we're talking about, yes, they have therapists, but like Last of Us takes place in like a zombie apocalypse. And so there are no therapists there. Um, I really like, I really wanted to be able to pull out concepts since a lot of people are going to therapy now and people are wanting to learn more about themselves and about relationships and about trauma and about mental illness I wanted to use television as kind of case studies if you will of the stuff that people are asking about like narcissism gaslighting you know all these things that have kind of worked their way into the the mainstream there are examples now that we can see on tv and I really think this is kind of the golden age of television there's so much yeah. really high quality television out there mm -hmm. that just seems like the perfect timing to do something like this I love it it's it's a great uh way to use the art form that is mm -hmm. television programming um and really to give it the credit that it it deserves right like their yeah. television really has gotten a bad rap um <laughs> because yeah. it's been it's been very well you know, they call it the boob tube, right? They'll say it'll yeah. shrink your brain and it'll make you go blind and, and mm -hmm. all of these things. And it, and I, I think what happened or, or something that I've noticed a little bit is that uh, when live theater shut down, mm -hmm. so much, so much of the talent of live theater then came into mm -hmm. the animation space and into the uh the television you know yeah. pay per view apple space apple tv and and netflix uh were able to grab that talent um where they were doing live shows and it it made me think about hamilton uh how oh, hamilton sure, yeah. was able to hamilton in live theater 
is beautiful and amazing and that's an art form, but they were able to bring that to mm -hmm. the public and to have millions and millions of millions yeah. of people and children be able to watch this show and, uh, and enjoy the show and learn from the show and experience it. Um, it's such a greater rate. And, uh, even gosh, Disney movies now yeah. uh, that come, you mentioned soul, I love that because yeah. the the talent of live theater, it's all coming into movies. Yeah. Lynn Morell, Lynn Mar Manuel Miranda, um, who did Hamilton, who did uh, Moana and did Encanto. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's beautiful art yeah. um, that we're seeing. And so I love the discussion about yeah. soul, uh, especially. So I haven't seen Ted Lasso, but I have watched soul probably 30 times. Yeah. Um, what well, are some I of think, the yeah. from that, sh that movie that you're bringing to your oh, life? Um, existential fulfillment and the idea of, you know, is it ever too late to pursue your dreams? And what happens when you don't? And the and the other one that I that I use a lot is that monster, um, the monster that um, Amy Poehler's character finds herself in when she's trying to like express her true self, and she's in this monster that's like all the negative voices. And I I like to use that concept of like we've all got that. We all go into that space where our negative voices are just consuming us, and we're paralyzed, and we're like you know, huddled up in a little like metaphorical ball because those negative voices are just coming down at us of you're not going to ever make it. You're not good enough. You're never going to be successful. And, and how so much of the struggle that we go through in life is figuring out how do I not allow those voices to, to destroy me? How do I keep prevent, like, how do I fight back so that those voices don't keep me stuck in purgatory? which is, you know, where she is. And so that's why I, what I like to talk about is, is this idea, like pursuing your dreams is so scary, but what if you did? What if you, you know, what can you learn from this movie about, about what, the, what the payoff can be and what it can be like on the other side of that when you, um, when you, when you go through that, that kind of scary wall of fire and, and want something more for yourself. I need to watch the movie Soul. Apparently, <laughs> it's so it's just a beautiful movie, and and I know movies and TV are, are get a bad rap, and they're kind of painted as just entertainment. But the people who write these movies and television shows, they're not writing them just to entertain. I mean, some probably are, and there are some shows that I will never ever watch because of that. But a lot of times, they're writing them to to give us that opportunity to view ourselves in a different light and view ourselves from a distance. And they are social crit critiques and, um, and trying to teach us something. And actors who play these characters, they don't just show up and read their lines. They, they go into a whole character study and they're learning about the backstories of the characters they're playing and trying to really bring that to light. And I, and so I think um, to just dismiss it as, you know, mindless entertainment, I think is doing this stuff a huge disservice. It's like, going to you know a museum an art museum and saying well you know they just threw some paint up, up, up on there mm -hmm. <laughs> to make it pretty like that you know that's not what television I don't think that's what a lot of it is meant to be it's meant to be a whole lot more than that mm -hmm. how did you get from I know you mentioned you have a theater background then and that's mm -hmm. why you're interested in tv how'd you get from that to therapy then well, it started with an inability to choose. I was a double major in college. I was theater and psychology double major. <laughs> so haven't really been able to choose from the beginning. Um, and then I moved to the Twin Cities with the thought of doing some theater and then figuring out if I'd moved to New York or, or LA or something. This was a long time ago. Um, and I ended up just staying here and getting a doctorate in psychology. Um, but I've done theater the whole time. I did theater through that and then after I had kids I um, started doing more like commercials and, and film kind of stuff um, while I was still doing therapy so I've I really have never just picked one I've been trying to find ways to do both my whole adult life and I think they're the same to me psychology and theater are just two parts of the same puzzle it's understanding Absolutely. people mm -hmm. and so I don't really view them all as, as all that different from each other you used the metaphor of using the art form of television as a mirror mm -hmm. and being able to use that to look at ourselves, look at our lives, look at our situations. And 
theater and therapy are both mirrors in that mm-hmm. way. Going yeah. to a therapist should be like looking in a mirror. Exactly. They, exactly. they are so, uh, they're so valuable, both of them in that same way. And it sounds like that's really what draws yeah. you to both. When they're both those. about perspective, right? Going to therapy is to have a person who's giving you a different perspective on your life and on how you feel and how you think about yourself. And to me, that's what television is as well. Theater, they're, they're about giving you perspective, a different way to view your life, a different way to view other people, a different way to view, you know, your surroundings. And so I do, I, I really feel like they're both, they both serve that same purpose of, Hey, what if you looked at it this way? What if you thought of your relationships this way? What if you thought of trauma this way Uh, or mental illness? Like let's, Let's hold up that mirror and see what else there might be that you haven't been able to to notice or observe on your own. And it's also about having something or somebody both serve this purpose, watching live theater or watching theater on television uh, and going to counseling. There is a validation in seeing somebody else understand what you have experienced Mm -hmm. or understand how you might be feeling or interpreting something that you have going on. And so if I watch a show and I go, oh my gosh, that's, I could, if I watch Mm -hmm. soul and I go, I, I understand I'm watching it and I'm watching my own experience be, you know, shown to me. And the same thing with therapy and counseling, when I'm in that session, I'm hearing my therapist and counselor say those things to me that I'm like, yes, that somebody yeah. else is saying the words yeah. that I'm trying to express and have understood. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in both roles, if we're an actor and we are using our empathetic process to go, okay, I want to understand what it is like to be this character. I want to mm-hmm. understand what it's like. What would I do? How would I think? How would I move? Uh, and being a therapist, it, it really is yeah. so transferable because when I'm sitting with a client, I want to know what is it like to yeah. be this person? Yeah. How do I think? How do I move? Yeah. What do yeah. I do? Yeah. Uh, what motivates so, them? What, yes. Why do they do the things they do? And that's what developing a character in theater or television is. It's I want to understand what motivates this person to do these things, to do the good things, to do the hurtful things. Like th- we all have motivation, we all have reasons to do things. Nobody is an, a villain because they, nobody thinks of themselves as a villain. No one thinks of themselves as the bad guy. And so when we look through, through characters, through that lens of like, they're, they're not just being a bad guy to be a bad guy. They're motivated by something. Mm-hmm. They're viewing themselves and the world differently than how the world is viewing them. And I just think that that's so much of therapy is, you know, you sit with people who, who do some stuff that like, isn't so great always, <laughs> you know, you sit with couples where you see them not treating each other very well. And if you just go, well, you're the bad guy then you're missing the point. But if you figure out, okay, what motivates you to act like this? What motivates you to talk to your partner like this? Then we get so much farther um, as therapists and we get farther as, as clients too. When we have somebody who's viewing it, not from who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, but like, okay, so tell me what motivates you. To, to be this way. I feel like Disney has, I know we were talking about soul. Um, I feel like lately Disney has done such a great job of creating yeah. villains or, you know, anti-heroes that are full people and that yes. show their motivations. We watched Moana last night and I was sitting there in the middle of it going, I thought this, uh, this the the guy who's voiced by The Rock, what's his name, um, Maui. I was like, I thought Maui was a good guy, right? But through it, he changes. When she mm-hmm. goes out to to find him, he's the bad guy. She's ready to fight him. And then, as we get to know him, we understand what his motivations yeah. are. We understand what he's been through. And then he's going to fight this other villain, which is the the lava monster, and. Then we meet the lava monster and then we give her what we meet her needs or Moana and yeah. Maui mm-hmm. meet that lava monster's needs, make that lava monster be able to feel safe again. Yeah. And then we realize that's not a lava monster at all. That's a trauma response from the exactly. island. 
Um, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's amazing. These characters, uh, Encanto is the same way. Uh, the the villified. Yes. Oh my gosh, Encanto. Ah, yes. oh, it's amazing. Study and, and family dynamics, family yes. systems. It's, it's that's what that movie is. It is yes. a case study in family systems. Tell us more about that. Well, I've only watched it once, so I probably can't go into a whole lot of detail. Um, but I mean that that is the movie. It's you know the mom escapes, you know the the war and creates this this new home for her family. But in doing that, in that trauma response of self protection, of family comes first, of you know the blind spots that she develops because her creating this home for a family was a trauma response that there are like, she has a lot of blind spots in her desire to create the best things for her kids and the belief that they're all, you know, meant for great things and they're magical. But then also what happens to Bruno? I mean, Bruno is, is like, he's the, the misfit. He's the black sheep of the family. And then what happens when he's misunderstood and then he goes and hides out and that just creates more, um, you know, creates more negative beliefs about him. And then now he's excluded more. And because he's the odd one, because he says the things that other people don't want to hear. And how often do we see that in family systems where there's that one person who's like, wait a second, I'm saying stuff here that's kind of maybe not great. And then the family deals with it by saying, yeah, we're going to just push you to the side because you're not fitting the family narrative. So bye. And I just think that, um, yeah, there's just so much there that's, I think I think family therapists in particular could just use that movie to start with and say, okay, we're going to do our first two sessions watching Encanto and take it from there. Absolutely, like the older sister who's like feels that burden to you know that that enormous burden to be the strong one. I mean, it's it's so clearly demonstrated in that movie that that feeling that a lot of older siblings have to be the one who's who's there for everybody and who doesn't get to. Like their needs don't matter. They have to be strong for everyone else, no matter the cost. And especially when they start to see their parents struggle or whatever, they feel this need to like, okay, I guess it's on me. I guess I'm taking care of everybody. I mean, like literally in that movie, I mean, she holds, I don't know if it's the whole house, but like she holds like a whole thing on her back. And I'm like, well, there's being in the oldest sibling. Krista can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, that's not like you're talking Krista, to Krista here, is right? the Louisa of her, <laughs> of her siblings. Um, Absolutely. It, you know, they, they created, uh, Encanto, they created those sisters and they made all of this, uh, merchandise for the older sister that was like the perfect one with the flowers and all. And they yeah. thought little girls were really gonna yeah. engage with that one. And they, they okay. do little girls like that one, but they weren't prepared for how much little girls wanted Louisa stuff. Yeah, They wanted that strong yeah. character. Strong um, and it's it's beautiful to see um, that again that family system represented, and to mm -hmm. see that uh, that come to an understanding at the end, where yeah, nothing is solved at the end of that movie. Nothing is yeah. fixed, but everybody understands each other better, and they understand they that the what they were doing wasn't working. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what brings families to therapy? Is when everything collapses, and. And they have to figure out something else because what they were doing just so clearly wasn't working and it was hurting the kids. It was hurting the people involved. Absolutely. So tell us about Ted Lasso and this show and how you're using it and how, how you are doing these deep dives because five episodes on one series is quite a lot. So and we probably won't do that many in a row for other shows but to launch this I really because this is the show that inspired it in the first place I really wanted to test the concept as we're getting as we're kind of warming up and getting our our, our format together I wanted to do this show because when I watched it um and so neither of you have watched the show so mm -hmm. just quickly um it's when you first like the first episode of the show you see what you think are characters and you're like, okay, I get it. Like there's this woman, she's the boss. She's out for revenge from her ex-husband. So she's the villain because she hires Ted Lasso to be the coach who fails because he's a never coach soccer. He comes over from the United States. He was a college football coach. And so we think, and he's like the doofy guy. He's like lovable. And he's got just like 
optimistic sayings for everything. And so you're like, okay, so the American comes over and he's the like lovable doofy guy from Kansas. Mm-hmm. And then Rebecca's the like mean bitchy boss and she's like out to get him. And so it's going to be battle between her and how is he going to win her over? And then you have like the groupie girl who's dating the, the arrogant star football player, soccer player, whatever you want to call football, soccer. Um, there's the grumpy guy, Roy Kent. And so you get this idea that, okay, here are all these people and they're two dimensional and blah, blah, blah. This could be fun. But then what's so amazing about this show is it does something that I've never seen a show do is it takes these caricatures and it slowly starts to show you what's underneath and why they came to be this way, why they came to be, you know, why Jamie Tart, who's the arrogance, you know, kind of caricature, narcissistic, superstar athlete, why he got to be that way. He has this alcoholic, abusive dad who demanded perfection from him, who made it like his kid's soccer career was about making him look good. And you start to see all of these vulnerabilities, all of these things that created these exteriors that they show to the world. And they do it in, in a way that doesn't like bang you over the head with it. It's not like some shows do a good job of talking, of portraying personality disorders and like dysfunctional sy- you know, systems and families and, and, and relationships but this does it in a way that isn't so toxic like it really does it in a beautiful gentle way but also really makes it clear that the people we are that we show other to others at work out and about with friends isn't necessarily who we really are inside and that it might actually be a way that we're trying to get our needs met or protect ourselves or um it's because this is what we've been taught is is what people want from us they want us to be you know we have to have a hard, beautiful exterior. If we want to be a successful woman, we can't be vulnerable. We have to be perfectly put together or we'll get attacked from the press. You know, like just, it just does such a nice job of showing all of that and showing how we have to be vulnerable in our relationships or they don't work. And um, how it, it does a beautiful job of showing relationship repair. It does an amazing job of showing why men need guy friends why men need to be able to be vulnerable with other men and how that really is what's transformative whether it's at work um in their pursuit of their sport or in their relationships that across the board men really benefit when they can connect with other men um yeah so there's just a ton there and that's why we did five episodes it reminds me of um Barney Stinson character in How I Met Your Mother, where yes, it's a comedy. Oh, and sure, it, right? yeah. But but he comes across as you were talking about, you know, the person who comes across as arrogant and uncaring. And and it reminds me of Barney Stinson's backstory because yeah, it's a comedy, but uh, you know, Neil Patrick Harris in How I Met Your Mother, he presents in such a as a caricature like you said right Mm -hmm. he's a womanizer and he he does his own thing he doesn't care and he has a ton of money and and he always wears suits and then as the show progresses you see his his backstory of you know who he was and he was in love with a girl and she left him for a guy who always wore suits and had money and he was going off to the peace corps and then he changed and it was in response to these things that happened, who's trying to protect himself. Yeah. Uh, and that helps that character become a real person, yeah. person. in our mind yeah. and more relatable. And so I, I love this, especially with um, a, a Jason Sudeikis character who uh, it sounds like he is the the coach that, yeah. uh, that is hired to come over and he's kind of, he's goofy and he's silly. He's goofy and he's, and he's a super optimist, but then he starts having panic attacks. And so we start to realize, okay, there's more to this guy than just this like self-actualized optimist who always has like this, who's just cheering on everyone else and making everyone else like transform. Like he's kind of the transformative character for all of these other characters. But then we realize that he has his own journey and his own stuff that he's not facing. And so they bring in Dr. Sharon for the other athletes. She's a sports psychologist, but we start to see how as as the therapist on site, how she becomes the change agent for him in a really amazing way. And how beautiful is that for, especially somebody like Jason Sudeikis, who tends to play from SNL and -hmm. from, uh, you know, different comedies tends to play kind of this caricature. He's big, he's Mm -hmm. loud, he's funny, he's upbeat and he says things in a certain manner to go beyond that in a show. Mm -hmm. 
um, is is just genius. Uh, it's yeah, genius casting, it even um, because yeah. when you see Jason Sudeikis in a movie, you know what you're gonna get, right? Yeah. You expect that. Um, and so starting out with, yeah, this is what I expect to see when I watch a Jason Sudeikis show. Yep. And then going deeper and really well, doing I almost didn't watch development. It. I put yeah. off watching it for a long time because I was like, nah, it's Jason Sudeikis. Like, what else do I need to know? <laughs> I just didn't think it would be. And so when everyone was talking about it, I was like, what is going on here? Like, it's Jason Sudeikis with mustache. Like, is it really <laughs> that good? And then I, I watched the first episode at the gym. I'll never forget it because I was like, okay, what the heck? I want something to watch, you know, something light and fluffy while I'm at the gym. And I finished it and I was like, why do I feel so much better all of a sudden? Like, I just felt like a little lifted, a little more buoyant. And I watched the next episode. And I was like, oh my God, this show really is kind of magical. And so then I got my mom watching it, my husband watching it, <laughs> and then I clients watching it. Um, and I've watched it like four times through for this podcast. And every time I am struck by something new, there's just so much in this show that... Um, yeah, that I just couldn't, I couldn't limit it to one or two episodes of podcast. As you can tell, like, I really, really got into it. Um, I haven't gotten into a show like that in a long time. So I do recommend it. Yeah, now I feel like we have to watch it. <laughs> you do. I think everybody needs to watch it. Apple does, like, trial subscriptions, you know, watch mm-hmm. it and binge the first two seasons and see what you think. But I think it's really worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I use Krista's Hulu account. So I, <laughs> well, I feel like I need to get Apple TV. TV and, and, <laughs> well, I need to get Apple TV and give it to Krista, and that way we'll be we'll be even. <laughs> yeah, so we can watch that shrinking show too, because you just mentioned your next episode is going to be about shrinking, mm-hmm. which is a newer show. I haven't seen it yet either, obviously, but. Um, and that's another Apple TV one, but um, yeah, so that's going more into like the therapist side of things than mm-hmm. as well as just the yeah. characters. Yes. That one's all about therapists and I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it kind of hurts to watch. I think I sort of whimpered audibly through the first couple episodes because it's really about therapists making some super questionable choices. Um, No, straight up unethical choices. (laughs) Uh, And so for that one, we're actually going to bring in a non-therapist to join us for that one because they really want to know for people who aren't therapists, what, what is it like to watch the show about therapists? making questionable choices and um and everybody here at at our clinic is talking about it like we're all just you know buzzing about that show because there's just so much there for therapists to chew on (laughs) and react to so Mm. yeah yeah that sounds like a great one as well because you're getting the therapist as a human perspective Mm -hmm. which we don't usually get (laughs) Very on television much. yeah all the human and also so another one where it's a guy who um jason seagal who is playing this actually this time this is a guy who's just playing the exact same character that he plays and everything um doofy guy um but his wife dies and he lose like he goes off the rails um and so we get kind of a and it's all exaggerated right but at the same time it's about like man, for therapists, we're humans. And sometimes our personal lives go off the rails. And how do we as therapists check ourselves? How do we as colleagues of therapists go to our colleagues and say, hey, I know you're going through a lot and I think it might be showing up and how you're doing your job. And can we talk about that? (laughs) You know, and um, yeah, it really, it really explores that um, therapists are human too. Um, And what happens when we're not paying attention to where we're at personally in our own lives and how might we negatively um, impact our clients if we're not paying close attention to how that's how we're bringing that into our therapy space. Absolutely. And that's a great way to kind of put our impact on other people as humans under a magnifying glass because Mm -hmm. as a therapist it comes out in these in these different ways but if I'm not a therapist and I'm not paying attention to what's going on inside me it's going to come out in all these different ways and I am going to impact other people it's not going to be therapy clients but I'm going to impact all the people Ah. in my life Mm -hmm. and that's a great way to kind of put that under a microscope and be able to say like here's an exaggerated version of that because they're a therapist um but really we're all doing that 
all the time. Well, it's about grief. Like two of the therapists were best friends with the wife who died. Like one was, was married to her and the other one was her best friend. And so they're mm. both having, going through a really intense grief response. And, you know, the and Jason Sudeikis' character is named Jimmy. He has a teenage daughter and he stops parenting her because he's so caught up in his own pain that that's all he focuses on. And so she's, she's also in pain. She lost her mom, but we really see how, and, and I know from working with clients that that happens when, when the parent loses their spouse suddenly and unexpectedly that I see that all the time where the, like the kid doesn't just lose one parent, they lose both their parents mm-hmm. because the other one can't function as a parent. They can't hold their kid's pain because they're so focused on their own. So it does a, it actually does a pretty good job of portraying that kind of grief response. Absolutely. There's some reparenting uh, opportunities there, Mm -hmm. Um, some self-parenting and Mm reparenting opportunities in watching something like that on television. Because if we're a child who lost a parent and then lost both parents because of it, um, even though that one parent was physically there, to be able to watch that as an adult and go, oh, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I, it wasn't because I wasn't sad enough about the loss. It wasn't because I wasn't good enough or helpful enough Mm -hmm. in filling in the gap. It was because this is what happens. This is part of that process for a lot of people. Um, And being able to see that happen to somebody else and going, okay, that happened to them also. It wasn't just me because of how I reacted. Yep. Yep. There are so many shows that I I think are so great too for um, communication styles. And uh, I I always had this list of um, for for behavioral health intervention for kids and then also for for therapy, this list of just YouTube clips that I had the link and I knew I could pull. And one of them was a a clip from Friends. I love Friends. And there's a clip where they're all yelling at each other. It's the one where nobody's ready, right? And so everybody's yelling at uh, each other uh, mm-hmm. and uh, because they're all trying to get, and that that's a, a show where the entire show takes place in the apartment living room. There's no mm-hmm. other sets. They're all in there together and they're all interacting with each other, which is awesome when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about assertive communication versus uh, passive communication mm-hmm. versus yeah. passive communication because there are so many examples of that it's great when we're talking about um transactional analysis because there are so many times you go okay you see that that joey just spoke to monica in his child right and monica always speaks in her adult right so monica almost almost always speaks in her adult and then being able to pull clips of monica speaking in her from her child to richard to chandler right to rachel sometimes and being able to go wow but when we think of monica's voice and friends we think about her adult because she almost always uses that why does she do that? Well, we know why she does it, right? Yeah. With with her parents and her growing up. Um, and so those ones where everybody's just fighting, right? But yep. we know the characters well enough to have hurt. Like I can picture in my head Chandler's adult and Chandler's child, yeah. right? And what happens when Chandler's adult talks to Joey's child? That's the dynamic we usually see on that show, right? Mm-hmm. But there are times right. where what happens when they intentionally use it where Joey's adult talks to Chandler's child, right? And that that disrupts the scene enough where they get a big laugh and we see it. Yeah. But when we pick that apart and be able to go, okay, I know what that means now. I understand when I'm using my adult and why yeah. I'm using it and when I'm using my child and why I'm using it. Um, it's it's mm-hmm. wonderful to have those examples kind of ready to go. Um, Sounds like I need to do an episode in Friends and bring oh, you in to talk about internal family systems and what oh we can my learn gosh. from Friends. Oh, I could talk about Friends for hours. <laughs> you could do multiple episodes on that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Louie is another amazing one for young kids. Louie is Louie. Louie. It's, it's my two kids are like dogs. 19 and 16. So okay. that might be before. It's two before, little like, dogs they're and they're. they're and the scenes are hardware store. The scenes are backseat of the car. The scenes are this person wanted oh, to go first. Oh, is this one that was like I... written about a dad and his kid kind of it's, through the tale of these two dogs? It No, it's a mom and a dad. Oh, okay, and, it's a mom and a dad. Okay. And two kids. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. 
And, mm -hmm. uh, and we use that all the time in BHIS or mm -hmm. kids will bring it up and be like, you know, say things from blue. And we're like, oh, that's from blue. <laughs> that's from yeah. this blue. It's oh, amazing okay. to hear how children are picking up these lessons from the show mm -hmm. because the show is not preachy. Uh, it's one of the best shows where uh, you look in the back seat of their car when the dad's driving and there's like stickers and snacks all over the seat, right? In the car seat. And there's That's like a fantastic. lollipop stuck in yeah. the car seat. And the parents will sometimes, the parents play, but the parents are also sometimes like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and right. you can, you can really, they're real characters in a oh, child's wow. show. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, I love what you're doing because yes, there are so many shows that have therapists and that have like Gilmore Girls, How I Met Your Mother, The Girl in the House Across the Street, mm -hmm. 500 Days of Summer, like Sopranos. There's so many examples of therapist mm -hmm. and picking that apart but what you're doing is you are treating these characters like people and yeah. you are talking about the thing mm -hmm. the way that they're interacting as people yeah. and I think that yeah. is so needed um in the podcast space and I think it's so interesting so well, thank you. I love it I'm, I'm super so excited. excited that we're doing this yeah yeah, I think it's great. Um, so if you are looking to uh, watch that podcast, it is on YouTube. It's called When Therapists Watch TV. Um, so you can go there on YouTube and click subscribe and uh, watch those episodes there. Um, the Ted Lasso ones are all on there, uh, episode one, two, and three. And then you'll have four and five coming out on Ted Lasso. Yep. Um, so check that out there. Uh, and then also you can listen to those, just the audio version on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any place that you would go to listen to podcasts. Um, so we're really excited to be able to hear those as they continue to come out. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Thank you. Um, Yes. And then if you are in Minnesota and you're looking for telehealth sessions or you're looking for uh, in-person therapy sessions, and if you're in the Twin Cities, uh, check out Ellie Mental Health Services in uh, the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, and you can look for uh, Dr. Terry Bly. And uh, if you need to remember how to remember her name, <laughs> her name spells <laughs> terribly. T-E-R-R-I. Sure does. -I. It spells terribly. I'll never forget it. Yeah. Um, so if you are looking for that, um, if you were listening to this and you went, man, I, I would love to be able to go into my therapy session and not have to just talk about what's going on with me, but to be able to connect it with the, the anime show that I love mm -hmm. or the, you know, the South Park episode that came out last week. Um, uh -huh. which, South Park is amazing for this yeah. also. Wow. Well, um, a lot, and, lot there. Yeah. Yes. And so. Uh, if you're thinking that, man, that sounds like a great thing and you would love to do that, uh, go check out um, Ellie Mental Health in Minnesota so you can get connected with sessions with Dr. Terry Bly. Um, so, Terry, if you could give one suggestion to somebody who might be on the fence about starting counseling, what suggestion might you give to that person? I think if you can identify what it is that you want to do differently with your life, if you are aware that something's not working, um, and you've tried other things. You've tried to you know, read books or, or talk with it with your friends and, and you have a clear goal in mind. Um, I think that you find a therapist who, who works, like if you find a good fit for a therapist, if you go to somebody, it, I don't think usually it can hurt to, to see if, if that person can hear you. Um, I think there's a real power to having someone outside of friends and family. And a lot of people think, well, I'm just paying somebody to like basically be a friend. And, and what I'd like people who are on the fence to think about is what you're, what you're doing is you're hiring somebody whose job it is, is to just see things from your perspective and to give you a, maybe a new perspective. So you've got somebody who's going to hear you hear where you're coming from. They're not going to interject with their own. Oh, well, well, I remember when I was doing that thing, like they're not going to do that. They're going to hear you. And then they're going to like put up that mirror and say, well, you know, you say you're this way, but I'm not, I'm not hearing that. Let's talk about like, let's talk about where you get that perception of yourself. Let's talk about where the belief about what you can and can't do, for example, comes from. Because I don't know as I, I don't know as that's true. I'm going to give you a different perspective. And I think, so if you're on the fence about therapy, I think it's maybe because you're not really sure what's going to happen in those sessions. Um, and 
and keep in mind like that you're in the driver's seat for your sessions. It's not somebody therapizing you. It's you telling someone your experience and seeing if they can give you a new perspective to get you unstuck. I love that. And if you don't like your therapist, yeah. by all means, fire them and go find somebody different. Yes, absolutely. I'm Dr. Terry Bly, and I definitely need a counselor. Awesome. Me too. So does Krista. We all, we all do. I love hearing therapists uh, that are in therapy. I think it's great. Yeah. It's so important. Um, Shout out to and- Krista, my therapist. She's awesome. <laughs> <I> love, <her. laughs> love it. Shout out to Emily. That's mine. <laughs> So awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Terry. This was really, really uh, great. We'd love to have you on the show again. Um, And if you are in Minnesota, definitely reach out to Terry. We'll have all of her information in the show notes. Um, If you are just a little bit south in Iowa and you're looking for uh, outpatient mental health therapy or in-home behavioral health therapy for your kids, um, a lot of people don't know this, but man, those in-home BHIS sessions... You could spend two hours playing a video game for behavioral skills. And I'm telling you, it's helpful. There's a lot to talk about behaviorally in video games Um, or sitting and watching YouTube clips, uh, watching Ryan's World. There's a lot to talk about about behavioral intervention uh, when we're watching those shows in behavioral health sessions. Um, so definitely give us a call at 800-531-4236. If you are a mental health therapist anywhere in the country and you're looking for play therapy CEUs, uh, live ones or uh, recorded webinars for CEUs, um, check us out at patreon.com forward slash heart and solutions. And if you are watching this on YouTube, please like this video, please share it and please subscribe to our channel so that you'll get these every single Sunday. And like Julie mentioned, we post new episodes every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central. So save up your laundry or your meal prepping or whatever task you don't want to do that week and do it while you listen to us Sunday nights at 5 p.m. And then we can help connect you with our guest for that week or help you reach out to your counselor to get scheduled that week as well. And if you have any questions for us, you can ask them anonymously now. Uh, We have a new phone number. You can send a text or leave a voicemail at 515-650-3231. Or you can also reach us on You Need a Counselor podcast on Facebook or on Instagram. So I'm Krista Hunt. And I'm Julie Johnson. And we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye.